like mad. And they chased us all day. And by the time we arrived in a mountain village at night, the horses were completely worn out, saddle galled and their flanks heaving. And we were as tired and just as scared. And we asked the villagers to give us water and fodder for our horses. And I heard the young Chinese officer say, Woman Shibalu Jun, we are of the Eighth Root Army. And I said to him, look, we're nationalists, not Eighth Root Army guerrillas. And he said, shut up. If we tell them we're nationalists, they won't feed our horses or water them. It was the first sense I'd ever had of the political grip the communists had acquired on the minds and the hearts of the people in the occupied areas. As war wears on, American aid increases, and Jiang is pleased. Reviewing the new divisions Stilwell has trained and equipped, Jiang hoards these splendid forces. They will be useful later. Stilwell violently objects. He wants to use them now against Japan. He has no interest in future civil war. Stilwell feels unless Jiang purifies his government, not only is he no help in this war, but once the war is over, surely the communists will win. Their quarrel grows. From Washington flies a mission to heal the nasty breach under Major General Patrick Hurley, an Oklahoma politician. Jiang sees this as more white man's arrogance, a meddling in the politics of China. No compromise is possible, and Stilwell is relieved of command in 1944. Certain American involvement in Asia will be long and tragic. The world rejoices as in 1945 the Japanese surrender, the guns they hope forever stilled. To sign the document of surrender aboard the Missouri, the Allies, America, England, Russia, invite Japan's first victim, China. In their eyes, China's only spokesman is Jiang Kai-shek, who sends nationalist generals to represent his people. The communists are absent. For Chinese, this is but the curtain to an act, the climax yet to come in clash with communists. To stop this dreadful prospect, General Patrick Hurley, now named ambassador, flies off to Yenan. He urges Mao, the war is over, let there be peace. Let Mao and Jiang divide the country politically, but unify both rival armies under a central government. America will underwrite the deal. Hurley puts a plane at Mao's disposal to explore the proposition in Chongqing. Thus, Mao arrives on the first plane flight he has ever taken. His safety guaranteed by Americans, this is his first face-to-face -face contact with the Kuomintang since the killings and uprisings of 1927. Six weeks of negotiation will produce apparent agreement as Jiang plays host to Mao before departure. The plans that lurk behind their smiles, however, deceive all Western eyes. For in the field, a race is on. Across the land, the broken Japanese must sign defeat, yield cities, garrisons, and guns. But which Chinese will take the guns and occupy the cities, communist or nationalist? The nationalists, with all the transport of America at their disposal, emplane their troops to seize the cities of the Yangtze Valley. This ease of movement will lead them on to larger appetite, dispersion of their forces up from the Yangtze to seize the cities not only of North China, but beyond, Manchuria with its vital industry and rails. Nor will the communists sit still. Together, Mao and Zhu, like Jiang, decide the key lies in Manchuria. They choose Lin Biao as field commander to make the dash. From Yan'an and North China, they will strike east and north, while Jiang is readying troops to move from Yangtze ports and airfields. By foot and pack train, Lin Biao sets out. The Russians have temporarily occupied Manchuria by the surrender terms with Japan. Communists expect to get from Russians surrendered Japanese equipment and guns and hold the countryside before Jiang arrives. The rumble of inevitable clash causes America to replace Hurley with General George Marshall. This architect of global victory is sent to save the peace for which so brilliantly he labored. Received by Jiang Kai-shek, Marshall gropes for American solution to the bitter revolutionary surges 
of a strange Asian nation torn by barbarisms a generation old. To his Chongqing headquarters, he invites a communist delegation led by Zhou Enlai, chief communist negotiator, to meet with Chiang Kai-shek's spokesman. Marshall suggests, and they agree to, an American answer for China's groping search for order, a federal government peacefully permitting the two parties to govern provinces they now hold politically, freedom of speech permitted everywhere, and disputes resolved by talk, not guns. In January 1946, both parties celebrate a truce with a handshake. No paper truce, however, can mend a nation ripped apart by 50 years of killing. Within two months, troops are on the move again. Each side blames the other, but a hundred savage skirmishes now flare to full-scale war. Manchuria is the cockpit of the struggle. The industry Japan has built and left is the greatest prize in China. Zhang's American-equipped troops seize all major cities to find a hollow triumph. The Russian occupiers have looted every factory before withdrawal. Ripped out sockets show where great machines once stood. For Mao, the fighting in Manchuria is prelude to the climax of his theories. The day when guerrilla bands group into formal armies and shove frontal combat at a weary enemy. He fights for more than safety now. His ambition seeks to mold all China to his theories. I asked Mao Zedong what their policy was with regard to freedom of the press, and he said they believed in absolute freedom of press and absolute freedom of speech, and it wasn't going to be like Chongqing when they won. Everybody would have the right to say whatever he felt. It wouldn't be censorship the way Chiang Kai-shek had in Chongqing. So uh, I said, you, you really mean that? And he said, of course we mean it. And I said, do you mean that if you come to power, Anybody will be able to print anything he wants in a newspaper or publish any newspaper he wants? And Mao Zedong said, of course, he said, except for enemies of the people. Nor did he ever define, and I was too young to ask him to define, what he meant by enemies of the people. Obviously, now it means anybody who disagrees with him. In summer 46, Zhang returns his government to Nanking, and once again, as 17 years before, reports the victory of his cause at Sun Yat-sen's mausoleum. The fighting in the north is only distant thunder in the Yangtze Valley. American advisors urge he seize this moment to win the hearts and firm the loyalties of his people by new reforms. Thus, in Nanking, Zhang convenes a Congress to write a modern constitution in one last try to govern China by the order Sun Yat-sen has preached. But the thrust of all his background is still military. His troops must win by force of arms. With American arms, he feels the communists can be crushed, but his troops dig in to garrison rail junctions, cities they have occupied. American advisors insist such static defense is major error. They say he pins down his best divisions where communist guerrillas will isolate them. Queen city of Jiang's victorious China is Shanghai, restored at last to Chinese rule, all foreigners' concessions wiped out. While battle flares in the northern provinces, Shanghai seems to thrive. The long war's dislocation has filled the streets with hungry refugees and homeless laborers, who offer muscle energy for little more than rice to feed them. But after 50 years of suffering, such sights are almost normal. What worries Shanghailanders most is this, their money. For slowly, then more swiftly, through 46 and 47, the cost of distant civil war destroys the value and the meaning of these bundled paper dollars. Inflation ruins the vital middle class of all the cities, the one great source of Jiang's political support. Novelist Stephen Becker remembers the panic years. The inflation was heartbreaking. When I got there in August of 1947, the exchange rate was 60,000 yuan to one American dollar. And when I left in September of 1948, it was 20 million yuan to one. But people on relatively fixed incomes were just ruined. In the summer of 1948, my wife and I had a continental dinner at one of Shanghai's best hotels. 
and the check came to 250 million yuan. Who lost China to the Reds, ignorant men will someday ask. But now, in 1948, sorrow scrawls its signature clear. Too many years of death and flight. Too many dreams betrayed. In 50 years of barbarism, a gangrene of the spirit has set in, erasing pride and will and hope. Peace, whisper the communists to weary minds. Peace, an end to roaming. Now submit. Peace, they say, accept our mastery. And peace. Land, they say, to landless peasants, refugees. Join us, they promise, and the land will be divided. All through North China slip their cadres, calling meetings to share out the landlord's fields, which soon they plan to snatch away again. Thank you.